play Mary Poppins. She told us a spoonful of sugar was what we needed, but we're now being told it is a killer. The UK is just bringing in a sugar tax to improve obesity rates, but isn't it our choice whether we indulge or not? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. Charging more in tax for sweet drinks in particular has had mixed results around the world. Now the UK is following and hopes there will be a fitter nation as a result. There is a war on sugar. The UK is the latest country to impose a sugar tax on soft drink manufacturers. The government hopes to tackle the UK's childhood obesity crisis. But can one blanket tax reduce the waistlines of a nation? Nearly a third of UK children aged 2 to 15 are obese. And over 60% of adults are overweight and one in four are obese, the sixth highest in the world. How will the sugar tax work? Manufacturers of soft drinks containing more than 5 grams of sugar per 100 mils will pay a levy of 25 cents per litre. For drinks with over 8 grams per 100 mils, the tax will rise to 34 cents a litre. The World Health Organisation recommends a daily intake of free sugars to be less than 10% of total energy intake. With manufacturers of drinks such as Coca-Cola, Lucozade and Ribena scrambling to reformulate their products to avoid the levy, will a sugar tax actually reduce consumption? The government believes the levy is working, with over 50% of manufacturers having reformulated their drinks. We're the first country in the world to have a tax on sugar-sweetened drinks that allows reformulation to escape the tax. All the other taxes, Mexico, France, various other countries, have all just put the price up and relied on the increase in price to reduce consumption. It expects to raise around $342 million through the tax, which is hoped to offset the economic costs of obesity. Each year, the UK spends more on the treatment of obesity-related diseases than the police, fire service and judicial system combined. But is sugar entirely to blame? Can one tax change a consumer's pattern of behaviour? Will consumers eat less sugar or simply opt for more sugary alternatives? The UK's Institute of Economic Affairs has said that consumers tend to be quite unresponsive to price hikes and a sugar tax will be regressive and wrong. Scottish consumers pushed back against the manufacturers of soda drink Iron Brew after they halved the drink's sugar content to avoid the tax. Consumers stockpiled cans and bottles of the original recipe in defiance. Are so-called sin taxes on sugary drinks, alcohol and tobacco simply ineffective? Is sugar tax the best way to tackle obesity? Can government intervention truly determine sugar intake? Or will it always be a matter of consumer choice? Well, I'm very pleased to say that joining us from Abu Dhabi via satellite, and we have Ayad Al Qatani, bariatric surgery professor and the director of what's called the Obesity Chair at King Saud University. That's in Riyadh at the round table, Ben Reynolds, Deputy Chief Exec of the Food and Farming Charity Sustain, Professor Jack Winkler, former Professor of Nutrition Policy at London Metropolitan University, and Ayala Spiro, Nutrition Science Manager at the British Nutrition Foundation. Well, if you don't, don't know what you're talking about, then, then nobody has a warm welcome to, to each one of you. Ben, kick it off. Is this going to work? Is it going to make any difference? Yes, I think so. Um, so we've been calling for a sugary drinks tax now for a number of years, uh, partly because the price of sugary drinks doesn't affect, doesn't reflect the cost on children's health and on our, the cost to our, our National Health Service. But more needs to be done elsewhere? Um, this is probably the most significant thing that the government has okay. done in years to actually try and tackle this crisis. So yes, it's certainly not the only thing they could do, but this is the biggest step we've seen. You see, Jack, nutrition policy is 
your specialization. Why has it taken so long to come round to this when everybody's known about it? Almost as long as they've known about smoking being bad for you. Oh, it's rather also well known that most voters don't like taxes. So we, governments tend to go shy of them. Uh, and uh, they've also been trying governments of both colors to shift the responsibility for the obesity away from them or the industry onto the consumers. It's your responsibility. You're the one who's getting fat. You're the one who has to change your diet. <clears throat> if you get into the business of taxation, you're accepting some of the responsibility for the national obesity rate. And that's, that's a big point, and it, it's a significant change. I would have thought one of the most important things is what was mentioned in that reporter piece there. It's not just the tax itself. It's that you're telling drink manufacturers, go out and change it, and it won't cost people as much to buy your product and that the manufacturers themselves are going to change their habits. Well, I mean, it can be that the manufacturers will put the price onto the consumers. That's to be seen, really, what happens with that. But there are three ways that it can work. As you said, it can make um, the manufacturers reformulate their products so that there is less sugar available in drinks. Um, it can make people reduce consumption of drinks. And the revenue that's raised can be used by the government for healthy initiatives in schools, for example, like physical activity. And all those things together are likely to have some impact on obesity, although we have to say I think that obesity is incredibly complex and just one tax probably isn't the whole thing. Isn't this just fiddling at the edges? No. Soft drinks are the major source of sugar consumption in many countries of the world, in the Middle East as well as in the UK and in North America. Uh, they've started with the hardest, with the most important source of sugar that we have. Well, let's go to um, the United Arab Emirates. And Ayad, let's talk about your country, Sa Saudi Arabia. Um, you're in charge of what is uh, called the obesity chair at King Saud University. 70% of people, it is said, uh, in Saudi Arabia are obese. Why so? This is very important uh, fact and uh, numbers because uh, it's not only 70% are obese, but also are overweight or obese. But also 60% of our population is less than 25 years of age or 30 years of age. So we are talking about all our young generation are really going to be suffering from multiple diseases in the future. Now, why so is because mostly, unfortunately, it's like everywhere, lifestyle, exposure to environment. It's multifactorial between environment, uh, eating habits, lifestyle, and others. Plus, like uh, what we call it, uh, genetic predisposition. Everybody, all, all of us are uh, predisposed to this. But the most important in our culture, at least in which is uh, almost unfortunately westernized in terms of uh, food intake and type of food we are taking. If you look to the meal every individual receiving, and this has been shown in multiple studies worldwide and locally, each meal is exceeding 1,500 calories. Now, that's uh, almost quadruple or t uh, almost double or more than double or uh, triple the requirement per each meal because usually you should be receiving 500 calories, not more than 500 calories per meal. So if somebody is taking the whole requirement of, of his day in one meal, that's a huge. So it'll end the day with almost taking almost 4,000, 5,000 wow. uh, calories. Let me ask you this question, if I may. There's yes. been recently a 50% tax in Saudi Arabia imposed on soft drinks, a 100% tax on energy drinks. I think it's been going for 12 months or, or so. Has it made any difference? Definitely. It made a difference, and that has been shown in, in two ways. One, the sales rate has decreased significantly. There are some reports in Saudi Arabia almost between 10 to 40 percent reduction. Now, this is in the early uh, months after the application of this ta tax uh, increase. The other point is uh, people uh, not buying this uh, product, and that will result, and this has been shown, it will result in reduction of obesity. There is a very important number to say if you really increase the tax by 20 to 30 or 40 percent, there is a chance of reducing almost up to between uh, 0.6 to 1 kilogram of a person weight over a year. So it's really direct relationship. You increase the tax, there is a chance of reducing the weight for an individual by almost 1 kilogram, and that will continue. 
The other point is, if you increase the price for a product that is not supposed to be taken, for example, like a sugary uh, drink and soft drink and others, by 10%, there is a chance of reducing the probability of uh, obesity by almost 13 to 14%. So these numbers are very important locally and abroad and has been shown by multiple uh, studies that there is direct relation between tax mm. uh, increase in certain products and the availability of this product and also the rate of obesity. So yes, it will affect it, but it is not the only solution. There are a lot of things maybe we can discuss. And how can we decrease the sugary intake yeah. Professor, in we... uh, our country or other countries to decrease the obesity? Professor, we will come back to you to talk about the type of surgery you have to do and the conference you happen to be at about obesity uh, where, where you are. But, uh, Ben, I know you wanted to jump in at that point. And, and Jack, I know you, there may be some questions you want to put mm. to our, our esteemed guest from Saudi Arabia. But, Jack, so, I mean, Ben first. In terms of that impact, I mean, we ran a pilot of the sugary drinks tax with over 100 restaurants, and this was independently evaluated by the London School of Tropical Hygiene and Medicine. And that showed that over the period of uh, the first year that we ran that, there was a 10% shift in sales to health options within those restaurants so you know these things do work definitely can so why I are we still getting fat? I just interject oh, okay. just yeah, briefly please. to say that yes I think that um, the evidence shows that taxes can reduce consumption what there isn't strong evidence for at the moment is that the tax is reducing obesity and that might be because it's very early days the tax has just come in the UK even in countries like France and uh, Mexico it hasn't been around for so long so it's showing that it's reducing consumption, but we don't really have strong evidence yet. I suppose, you know, it's going to be a, a slow process, but you're saying it is the most important step. It's well, going to take a while before we know whether it's yes, working. Yes, but I, I'm shocked by the numbers that I've just heard. Here you have a 50% tax, and, well, it's rough numbers, it's only reduced consumption by 10 or 14%. That doesn't seem to me a very large reduction. Mm -hmm. Especially as, as we were talking about before we went on air, many people buy in supplies and hoard just before the tax comes in. I would be very interested to see uh, long-term figures in Saudi Arabia. It's the most interesting country in the world when it comes to sugar taxation, along with Britain. But if, it, if a 50% or 100% tax cannot produce a reduction of more than 10%, then we've got to think about that. Well, way. let's ask the professor this, and please feel free to jump in. I'm not the only one asking questions here. Uh, but I am um, in the Emirates at the moment. Back in your surgery in, in Riyadh, have you seen a reduction in the number of people who come to you for bariatric surgery, which is based, you know, I'll simplify it here, it's, it's shortening the gut so you don't absorb so much nutrition and you don't get so fat. But have you seen a number of people, or fewer people, coming to you? That will, not, that will be too early to, to have an effect directly on the number of patients going to surgery because you need definitely a period of time for this to be effect. And I agree with the comment that initially people, when you apply this tax, which was on June 2017, tax of 50% and 100% on the other product, um, you, people are packing it even before the tax, so that will be the sales, initially in the first few months, there will be reduction in sales. But afterwards, you'll see, maybe in a six months' time or so, you'll see more effect on the sales after consumption of it has been packed before the tax raise. So this is very important to see it and watch for it. I expect, and this has been also in the studies that has been, or at least the estimation from different uh, sales uh, venues, that it's up to from 10 to 40 percent, not only 10 percent. There are some reports up to 40 percent. So we expect that will increase. Now, in terms of surgical that cases, four zero. people coming to our four. clinic with obesity, that we, we definitely will take time. Uh, one four percent or four zero percent? It is 10 percent to four zero, 40 percent. Uh, four well, zero. What, what, so, what kind yes, of numbers is, are those? Uh, this range, because <laughs> we have different sources. May I ask you this? Yes. Uh, you are at a conference in the United Arab Emirates dealing with obesity. What is felt to be, amongst those people you've talked to, uh, the biggest matter for concern and the easiest matter in which to deal with obesity? Complicated subject, but the most important and immediate thing that, that should be done. This is a very important question because uh, there are, in every uh, area, whether here or abroad, strategies are the most important things to be effective. 
The strategies will be on different aspects. One is related to, I, we call it, we divide it three environments. The environment at home has a lot of strategies to be done from the family, from the uh, personnel themselves, from the patient or the person who is obese or so. The environment at school, which for kids and so on, and that has to be controlled from fitness point of view, from food and other bio exposure and sugar uh, intake in the school and education and everything related to that environment. And the city environment. City environment, we have to be adapted for providing better areas and venues for exercise and other, plus the restaurant and others around us, which unfortunately they are not really uh, following any protocol in terms of how many calories exposed. They should be allowing us, allowing anybody who's coming to the restaurant to see. And this has been recently applied in Saudi Arabia, that every restaurant or every uh, food providers they should label every uh, type of food with their calories uh, uh, amount, with their type of, uh, like salts, with their sugar and that thing. So I have the, ch the chance and the choices mm. to choose what is right and what is wrong for me. But uh, currently, yet, unfortunately, nobody, you come to a meal or you come to some product to buy and you don't know what is there. Uh, and yet, you three were saying before the program began that you think labeling, which has been around uh, for, well, several generations, well, at least a generation, um, has been a failure. Yes, it's been a total failure, globally. <clears throat> We've had three international studies, one by WHO, WHO Europe, OECD, looking at nutrition policies around the world over the last 30 years. Overwhelmingly, everywhere, they've come to the same conclusion. It's been education directed at final consumers. That emphasis on education has co coincided exactly with the global obesity epidemic. If you ever want clearer evidence of a failure of a nutrition policy, it's labeling and nutrition. I think it's more complex than that. I think our environment has changed radically in the last 30 years. Um, we have much more availability of um, cheaper, energy-rich foods. Our physical environment has changed considerably. Our, our schools and um, health centers have changed considerably. Um, these are, this is a difficult and complex problem. I think we need to think about things in terms of a multifactorial solution. Certainly labelling wouldn't be part of it, but it, it forms part of consumer education. Um, now in out-of-home sectors in the UK, you can see calorie content, more, mm. um, more um, organisation. But you've got, you've, got, you've got to burn your calories off, haven't you? And if you spend all your day, this is another argument perhaps, all your day on a, a screen that size and don't get your legs moving. <laughs> There are, there are some sort of interventions that, uh, that are also sort of seen to be effective. Um, but as Jack said, that the, these have been studied and the tax is one of them that has been studied and it will play a part. But there are... bring ben in. I, I was going to say, I, mean, I don't know what your views are on, on some of those other solutions. Yeah. I mean, saying it's a sort of multi factual approach I think is true but this is exactly what we hear government saying and businesses yeah, yeah, saying yeah, to yeah. let themselves off the hook and actually what we need to look at is what what next beyond the sugary drinks tax. Well, okay what next? Um, I mean <laughs> certainly um, what we want to see over the next few months is government committing to more work around junk food marketing more restrictions around junk food marketing I think fiscal measures looking into those there's certainly a, another role in that but um, the government uh, a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago released the childhood obesity plan which was incredibly weak insipidly weak um, the only thing in it was a, was a sugary drinks tax, which they'd already committed to a few months earlier. Because people don't like taxes. Well, that's yes. But there, was, there, was a, there was also 20% on other um, sugar food. There's, yeah, there has been some good, some, some, some progress change. around reformulation. Well, we will see what the progress is around Jack's been very polite. He puts but, his hand but up I think, before you speak. But I think <laughs> junk food marketing, I don't know what your views are on, on what, what needs to happen around that. But yeah. Well, uh, uh, can we give, say, something nice for what? Of course. Uh, I think the government... Now, the current government, and it pains UK, me... UK, UK government, yeah, yeah. And it pains me to say anything nice about George Osborne. really pains me. But nonetheless, the present government has settled on the two most effective instruments that they can use. Because we should say this goes back to his time as Chancellor. He's no longer there. He's mm -hmm. editing a paper up the road. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but he's introduced a price instrument. In this case, we're talking about the, a soft drinks industry tax, but there are other price instruments you could use. He secondly instituted two reformulation programs, one across nine, product, nine product categories of sweet foods and one about calories across popular fatty foods. It's those two instruments, price instruments and reformulation, which are the key to the future. And what we 
we could be expanding, as Ben is saying, is, is into new areas, but we could have other price instruments and other reformulation programs to strengthen those. Because, of course, we're not just talking about sugar here. We're talking about why people are getting fatter and fatter. And I'm going to go to um, the UAE once again, then we'll bring back the discussion to end it here in, in the studio. But, Professor, we're talking about education. Yeah, because you mentioned labelling. We're talking about education, and education should be and probably mostly is directed at the young. Do you think the young um, in the Gulf region, which is your area of speciality, and in Asia where there's so much obesity, particularly in India, um, the young people are getting the message that they should, being taught it, if not absorbing it? Uh, recent, recently, yes, definitely. And I think, uh, but unfortunately, you have it in two levels. The students themselves with the family, they are really aware and they are really very concerned about obesity. Everybody is concerned. I, you will be surprised that we see somebody, children coming to our clinic with their family, though they are not that severely obese or maybe overweight and they are really looking for solution, being 10 kilograms extra or so on, they are looking for solution. So yes, the awareness is very important in the school and outside the school within the education. But the other problem, the teacher themselves, they need a lot of way to teach them and to get them involved and engaged about how to educate. Because if really if they are not ready to educate and to teach the kids how to live normal lifestyle and a healthy lifestyle and food and others, then they will not be successful. So it is there and the concern is there and they are working on it, but it's not up to the level that expected okay. to change. The other things I would I, like I'm to add have to, in terms of... Uh, Professor, I'm going to have to jump in, jump in at this that point. has been said about the school. I'm going to have to jump in at this point uh, because of time. Uh, what yes. I want to say, bringing it back to the studio, is something that I mentioned at the beginning. Isn't it our choice whether we eat sugar or not, whether we smoke or not, whether we drink or not, whether we take risks or not? Isn't it down to the individual? Why does this matter to society as a whole? Partly because of the cost to the taxpayer. I mean, this is one of the reasons. This is a five billion pound burden on the NHS, diet-related disease. That's the minimum yeah. estimate. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the, <laughs> you could have much bigger yeah, estimates. Yeah. And, and to supplement Ben's point, behind the obesity epidemic is coming a diabetes epidemic, uh, including among the young. And if we get diabetes on a massive scale, that will break the bank of the NHS. And not to, not to forget dental health as well. You know, hosp hospital admissions, dent tooth extraction is the main reason for five to nine-year-olds. These days? Going to hospital. Yes. Good uh, gracious. And, and it's been that I way since... I thought it was something from our generation. No. I thought it had gone away. And the predictions ago, are that this same. tax would cut, I think it's, it's about a quarter of a million cases of uh, dental tooth decay in children. So it's for that reason, I think and, it's... And, and, to supplement Ben's point, tooth decay, lots of small inexpensive treatments total up to the second most expensive disease of the lot. Well, of course, you know, one of the things we could argue about here is whether dental care is covered under the NHS. But also, a lot it's of important it, about an awful to, to realise the quality, you know, the quality of life of somebody going through dental care. It's not just about the cost, it's about thinking about how people that have obesity um, not only have health issues, but they have mental health issues, they also have physical disabilities, and it causes absenteeism from work. But I would also point to the fact that I think it's too simple just to say it's somebody's responsibility when they live in a very obese environment and I think it's up to us as the media as journalists as food producers as government representatives to make it to join together to make change you, you've got a chance just towards the end of this program now to say a direct message a towards young people in particular but to the authorities such as UK government authorities Quick, very quickly, Ben. I would say uh, be bold. We've seen the sugary drinks tax being being adopted. That was a bold action. Let's see more bold action, particularly on junk food marketing. Uh, and we'd back a call for a 9pm water share. How long before we see any results from this? Decades. And your message? To young people and to the authorities? Don't talk directly to people. Talk to the government. Change agricultural policy so that you produce and import less sugar and you raise the price of it. So then the manufacturers of sweetened foods, which is the main source of sugar, who are very, very price sensitive, then they'll use less. I, I'm gonna, I'll come to you in just a moment, but since you represent partly the agricultural industry as well, I mean, is it going to be possible to persuade farmers to produce less sugar, sugar beet in this country or whatever? Or is that, is that a matter? It's, I mean, this is a, it's a really <laughs> complex issue, and I think particularly uh, with Brexit, and we're going to be looking at sort of tariffs and the... the sort yeah. 
uh, the, sort of the, the potential for imports of lots of cheap sugar, which might completely um, uh, throw, the, uh, th throw the sugar tax out the window. But I, I know Jack's done a lot of work on this. And well. no, no, we have to go to Ayala because we're time to wrap up in just a second. My message uh, would be that sugar is important and the sugar tax is a step but it's not just sugar. And we need to think about healthy, balanced diets. We often forget when we talk just about sugar that there are issues like fats and calories, but there are also important micronutrients for the health of the nation. And things like eating more fruit and veg, having better products will help that. OK, well, uh, YouTube is where you can find this programme in perpetuity, roundtable on YouTube. You've got a chance, if you go there, to, to leave your thoughts about what we've been discussing. Uh, it's good fun to read them. Sometimes it's instructive as well. <laughs> um, in, in terms of the, the long-term health of this nation, continue watching this programme. Program. Roundtable with me, David Foster. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you to all of my guests. And I hope not only have we perhaps informed, we've entertained, and maybe a little bit of education as well. Goodbye for now. <laughs>